Good afternoon everyone and welcome to today's webinar on an interesting topic. Today we'll be talking about world's largest radio telescope. We have uh, Dr. Andrew Faulkner from the SKA project in Cambridge University with us. This webinar is brought to you by Digital Systems KTN and SKA project. We are using a third-party platform to deliver this webinar to you. During the presentation, you are welcome to ask questions using the questions panel. If you have any problem or any concern with the webinar, please chat to me using the chat window. Or if you want to draw our attention, just use the raise hands facility. We will start about in a minute now, minute from now, so please bear with us. Okay, let's start. Today we have Dr. Andrew Faulkner with us who is working on SKA projects. He is responsible for the system design throughout the SKA project with particular focus on aperture array developments and interests of UK. He has had a long successful career at senior company management level in the computer manufacturer industry before he took up a PhD in pulsar astronomy. After completing his PhD in 2004, Andrew has, is deeply involved with the technical development of the aperture arrays in the UK and also in Europe. He has served on many committees and teams for the International SKA project. His combination of engineering and manufacturing background with a scientific PhD has proved unique and valuable in the development of the SKA. Over to Andrew for more information on SKA, what it is and how it is going to be beneficial for UK in general and to several SMEs and knowledge based economies and uh, companies in particular. Over to you Andrew. Well, thank you, Mahisha, uh, that, uh, and uh, thank you for the invitation to present the Square Kilometer Array program. Um, and as you say, this is a project for the what will be the world's largest radio telescope by some considerable margin. Uh, it's headed to be built in the Southern Hemisphere and will be of order 100 times more sensitive than any of the existing radio telescopes. I thought it would be useful um, maybe to, if, if this manages to follow through, with uh, just showing uh, a brief video that's going on uh, that, that, uh, the S of the SKA so that uh, you can all get a, a bit of a, an appreciation of what this thing might be like if we can get it to uh, bring it to fruition and maybe then I'll start to flesh out some of the details after that. So if you can 
bear with me with this morning. Let's see if this thing uh, actually will do the business. Um, as you can see, the SKs can be built in a in a remote desert, it's either in uh, southern Africa or in Australia. Uh, I hope this is coming through properly, but you can see that it consists of it. Of, there's three collector types. Uh, there's the dish system being shown here which might have one or two thousand fifteen meter diameter dishes. Um, and you get the flavour of the, the quantity of these things when you're actually out in uh, that would exist in initially a five kilometer area. The square kilometer um, that's referred to in the name is actually the total collecting area that's available to the SKA. Now of course collecting area is important to absolute sensitivity. What's being shown here is the uh, very low frequency and all electronic telescope, a, a phased array with relatively large collecting elements which can operate at frequencies going from about 70 megahertz up to 450 megahertz. And this is illustrating a higher frequency aperture array, which is actually a very uh, challenging development and maybe something we'll talk a bit further about. And that's been largely developed in Europe and is certainly extremely advanced. You get the scale of this thing is of all the 60 meters, uh, these are 60 meters across, maybe 250 of them. Uh, this is illustrating that it's actually concentrated in one area of about 10 kilometers across, each core being about 5 kilometers diameter. And then it spreads out actually to continental scales going out along spiral arms, which has been illustrated here. And uh, that is still quite a lot of telescope, up to about 200 kilometers. But then the, uh, the very longest distances, which is very high resolution around to about 3,000 kilometers. So I hope you have some idea of the scale of this. Now, it is uh, uh, an international program in that it's been so-called born global, meaning that uh, virtually every country that has an interest in radio astronomy is participating in this telescope. It will operate uh, from about 70 megahertz, as I say, and the top frequency of the dishes of about 10 gigahertz. So it needs several collector types to be able to cover that range. Um, what I've got here is a few slides just to sort of help guide the conversation a bit. And this is showing the, uh, the higher frequency aperture rays. These things would operate from 400 megahertz up to about 1400 megahertz, for reasons that I'll explain in a moment. And each of these arrays, as I say, is about 60 meters across and would consist of something around 75,000 dual polarization individual elements. But maybe we'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, here there's uh, a few pieces of information that might be useful to people. The, uh, the overall SKA website is at sktelescope.org. And the video that we've just shown is uh, available on that website if, uh, through this link that uh, I'm just illustrating here. And it's readily found just off the, off the website itself. Now, as I say, this thing is a continental size device. So whilst it's called a square kilometer, that refers to the collecting area that would be available uh, of the telescope. And it's not a single collector, as you could see, there's uh, maybe one, two thousand, or maybe a few more dishes. There's a huge number of the mid-frequency aperture arrays and uh, uh, 250 of the lower frequency arrays as well. The very long baselines gives extremely high um, resolution, which is important to some of the science experiments. But many of them require a very close co uh, uh, concentration in the core for uh, collecting the very weak signals from very distant galaxies. Very briefly, uh, the square kilometer array was born out of the desire 
compared to image and survey neutral hydrogen, which uh, emits very gently at about 1.421 gigahertz. And if you can detect neutral hydrogen through the galaxy, then you can get a map, indeed a, a, a volume of where maybe a billion galaxies are. But you do require huge sensitivity, which is where the SKA itself comes from. And conveniently, since the universe is expanding and expands more quickly the further away you are, this causes uh, redshift on that 1.4 gigahertz. And so you can, by virtue of knowing which direction you're pointing in and what frequency a line turns up at in, uh, for a galaxy, you can place these galaxies in 3D space. And from that, uh, people much cleverer than me can uh, do a bit do a fundamental physics. So this is really a physics experiment. As I say, there's these three collective types. Uh, the top left is the low frequency sparse array, as it's called. So it's spread out uh, spaced about one and a half meters or more uh, uh, between these receivers. And each of those little receiving elements is a dual polarization individual receiver. Within the uh, mid frequency array that you see illustrated at the bottom, you've got them close packed in a regular pattern. And there's good physical reasons for that, which you don't have time to go into here. But of course, you need a great deal more of them since the wavelength is much shorter. And so it becomes very challenging in the amount of electronics involved. The configuration, as I say, is uh, closely packed in the core, where you would expect to have a considerable amount of, of uh, central processing not least of which is the correlator, but may well be some further uh, processing equipment. All of this has, of course, to be connected up using uh, a great deal of uh, communications equipment. And indeed, the SKA is performance is likely to be limited more by communications than processing. If we take a very quick look at the top level schedule, as I uh, th th this, this telescope was conceived actually in the 1990s as something of uh, an aspiration. Uh, that gathered momentum through the 1990s and at around 2000 we uh, got a great deal more uh, organization coming together where all the different countries agreed to work together. And from there you had a, a lot of ideas of where this might be developed from. And so those uh, alternative designs going on. There was, uh, in the period 2005 through end 2009, there was a great deal of research into what this device might be built from. And now we're entering a much more serious phase of uh, designing and costing it and coming together with the uh, so-called pre-construction phase 2013 through 2015 to uh, finalize a great deal of the design of this thing. So we're getting into, into serious development uh, work. Uh, in 2016, there's uh, the phase one construction, which would be about 10% of this telescope. And the total value of, uh, of that is about 300 million euros, maybe 350 million euros, actually. Uh, that, uh, that's uh, part of a total of about 1,500 million euros, one and a half billion euros for the full instrument. Um, conveniently, a, a radio telescope can be built in parts. A, a, a piece of a radio telescope is actually useful because you build it out of a, a lot of individual components. So unlike many physics instruments, you can build a piece of it and use it. And then it, that'll get extended in phase two through to 2023 into the into the photometer array. Um, in order to develop this thing, we do need technologies to move forward in the anticipated way. So we, we've got a, a view for the processing, for example, which will uh, require uh, developments that go on over the next five or ten years. But if we don't have that, then it will either have much lower performance or it will cost far too much money to do. So we've got, uh, uh, we, we do have to finally select the site, which is a 
a matter of some contention, I have to say, between Australia and South Africa. But that will be done in early 2012. And then we go 